just a big Charleston contest. I am uh, Stefano. I am an Italian man. You've reached the house of unrecognized talent. Not upon St. Peter that Christ found the church, but upon himself. But my dear doctor, many authorities disagree with you. Capetus, Scotus, Peter Lombard, for instance. Say nothing of Cyprian and Nazi answers. Yes, doctor, they do. But my authority disagrees with all of them. And who is that authority? St. Paul. Domo Arigato, Mr. Scotto. And welcome back to the Brooklyn's Dad Talks About Everything podcast. I am your humble host, Michael Scotto. Today on the podcast, we don't dive into Colossians 2. Because I was printing it out and reading it and going over it and looking at some Greek. And I fell in love with Colossians chapter 1 again. So we're going to look at that very quickly. But we're also going to look at somebody attacking dispensationalism. You know that's not going to fly on this podcast. Why is everybody always picking on me? That uh, Our clip today was from the early 1950s film Martin Luther. And that scene is the dramatization of the debate with Johann Eck the apologist, and the point there being that Luther knew he was familiar with all the early church fathers and uh, didn't care because his authority was scripture, St. Paul, as he puts it there. So anyway, that's sort of my overall reaching point today. Again, sometimes these things tie in better than others. Well, in two parts today in our short time together, first I want to talk about uh, some recent attacks on dispensationalism. Now, I don't represent all dispensationalism, obviously, but still, just the generic idea of dispensationalism. Uh, and it's interesting, I'm going to try not to use funny voices for these guys, because I don't know them too well. And actually, one of them, uh, I have some respect for some of his opinions on a multitude of issues, not having to deal with a particular interpretation of Scripture uh, in, in this area. But, you know, I like some of the things he has to say about defending the overall truth, the finished work of Christ, those sorts of things. So I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. The other one was rather uh, an aggressive fellow, <clears throat> called some nasty names. One of my favorite was Abhorrent Dispensationalism. So I wanted to get that on some business cards. Michael Scotto, Abhorrent Dispensationalist. Uh, so that's me. Anywho, uh, but the funny part about it is they were both going after dispensationalism, and then I put these two guys in a room, they would really be at odds with each other, really at, uh, at other ends of the, uh, the spectrum on a lot of different issues, but they seem to come together on this attack on dispensationalism. So I kind of find my, found myself sort of poking two bears in two different directions, which was rather interesting. Uh, but anyway, I, you know, I tried to handle it. I didn't get too deep into it because I know where they're coming from. And, you know, heresy, dispensationalism, the heresy. I mean, we talk about that a lot on this program. And what I always say is unless they're planning on going to Jerusalem for the Passover this year, and unless they just spent, uh, I mean, for Pentecost coming up, and unless they spent Passover going to Jerusalem to the temple to sacrifice lamb, they're dispensationalists. Unless you're building an ark, you're a dispensationalist. Unless you're living in the Garden of Eden, you're a dispensationalist. You just don't like the word dispensationalism, and they attach a lot of nasty things to it. Uh, I don't know if we talked about it. We probably talked about it sometime before, but I can't remember who it was now. Big, big name in theology, actually in, in dispensational circles. He, he went after E.W. Bollinger and Bollingerites, as they call us, the hyper-dispensationalists. And that's my dog hacking in the background. Anyway, the, the thing was full, filled with lies, accusing Bollinger and accusing us of universalism. It was a rather weird, strange attack. I was reading it going, I don't know who he's talking about, but nobody I know is a universalist. Uh, so anyway, the irony is, it is dispensationalism on the one side, uh, the guy who understands sort of the Church of Rome and its place in history and its uh, place in the end times, that sort of thing. And we would agree on a lot of that. He's attacking dispensationalism, but dispensationalism is the system which is completely foreign to Rome. Uh, it completely pulls the rug out from underneath their feet, so to speak. And we won't go into the details of that theologically here, but that's what it does. And the other guy who was, you know, he called Protestantism, you know, the third wave of Christianity and was very, very demeaning and mocking of uh the current state of Christianity, and both of them, you know, dispensationalism is the demise of truth, and even though they both are other ends of the spectrum, and, you know, I step in the middle and say, actually, you know, I gave a defense as nicely as I could, just one to each, and let it go, let them come back with their, whatever they wanted to say after that, I know I gave a legitimate defense in writing. Anywho, they, uh, they commenced their attacks, and again, if I would come out from the middle of them, they'd be attacking each other. I think was what happened, actually, in one of those threads. I think they ended up going with each other, and I just stepped out of it. 
But the irony is, it's the dispensationalism, particularly the kind I believe the scripture teaches, that is the answer to both, to protect people from both these extremes. It's the only thing that really answers, to me, a correct handling of the word of God. So anyway, like I always say, you know, there's, we look at the Bible differently. That's okay. You, you interpret it your way. I interpret it God's way. So no, it's just a joke. It's just a joke. But uh, anyway, uh, again, that's what I endeavor to do. And one of the things about end times things is I say they're in pencil as best as I can understand them in light of me trying to rightly divide the word of truth, according to Second Timothy. So it, uh, the irony is, again, that a proper dispensationalist view, my dog is hacking over here. But whenever he eats human food, he just licked my plate. He, he does this hacking thing. Uh, he's been doing it for eight years now, so don't worry about him. The thing about my version of dispensationalism, which I obviously think is correct or I wouldn't hold it, is that it any sort of problems that people have in Scripture is answered by these rightly dividing the word of truth. All the issues they may have in confusion uh, when they try to explain away the parables, they try to explain away... The contradict, seeming contradictions between Matthew and John, we talked about those here, the seeming contradictions between Paul and the Lord. Uh, I remember I was uh, at somebody's house for another reason. It was a musical thing. It had nothing to do with theology. But I just while we were sitting around and I was waiting to play my part on the bass, I was looking at his books and he had, you know, how the whole book about how Paul, somebody took the letters of Paul and turned them into something they never were and that kind of thing. And you have those people who don't like Paul a lot. And then there's those of us who accuse us of abandoning Christ for Paul, which is absolutely not, absolute nonsense because Paul exalts Christ. Paul really exalts Christ, and we exalt Christ in every way we can. We just exalt the wonderful riches in Christ that were promised to us from before the foundation of the ages, and we talked about that recently, and the, the wonderful blessings in Christ in the far above the heavens at the right hand of God where Christ sitteth, you know, in the temple being created in the true holy of holies far above the heavens, these are all glories to Christ, and they're all they're all made possible by Christ alone, by his death, burial, lack of decay, and resurrection. We've talked about that a lot on this podcast. So we exalt Christ in every which way possible. Christ is everything, his death, burial, and resurrection. But that's why we actually believe that when you get bogged down into ordinances, and you get bogged down into keeping the Sabbath, and you get bogged down in earthly endeavors and earthly hopes— you're missing out on the unsearchable riches, and again, that was a title recently, that people are, are settling for less, is what we called that that podcast. And that's fine. I mean, I'm not their judge. They'll stand before the Lord. I don't know their individual lives. I don't know what they do or understand. But from our point of view, they're really missing out on really the, the blessings that are available to them if they step into it. And we talked about blessings. You have to step into blessings. Like, you know, like the 12 spies went into the land, but it was only Caleb and Joshua who believed God, and they were the only ones who were allowed to step into those blessings. They were all believers. They all, came, they all came out of Egypt. They were all baptized unto Moses, but they only the two of them were allowed to go into the land. Even Moses was not allowed to go into the land. So there's a difference between getting a free gift of redemption and then the idea of stepping into different blessings. And we believe you have to step into these blessings by faith. That's not Gnosticism. That's biblical, right? It's not hidden from anybody. You can understand it if you, if you want to, right? So my dispensationalism answers both of these guys, their extremes, and again, these are guys that would really go at it, and we're going at it, I think, when I stepped out, as much as I, I didn't want to go back in there and gets ugly. I shouldn't say that. Maybe it wasn't ugly, because I didn't read it. So maybe they were wonderful and kind and loving, and they hugged at the end of it uh, digitally. So that wasn't fair on my part. But anyway, I stepped out, and, and but as I, the irony was that over in this one thread over here, I was getting called a heretic, and in this one over here, my theology would be calling abhorrent. And two guys that were on the other, other ends, ends, opposite ends of the spectrum. And here I am, stuck in the middle with you. Uh, stuck in the middle with Paul. And uh, I, really, so anyway, now we're going to sort of transition over to one of Paul's post-Acts letters, the book of Colossians. I'm going to talk about Colossians 2. I mentioned this, um, that I really want to dive a little bit deeper into Colossians 2. I've talked about it a lot, but I really want to break it down more. But while I was doing that, I just kind of pulled up Colossians chapter 1 to kind of read through the book. Get a, get a feel for the whole. You know, this podcast is all about context, and my blog is all about context or confusion, www.contextorconfusion.com. Uh, anyway, I was just reading it, and Colossians chapter 1, this is from the Far Above All translation, which we, we recommend here, uh, faraboveall.com. From Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ in Colossae, 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying for you always, having heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love toward all the saints because of the hope which is reserved in the heavenly places which you have heard of before in the word of truth of the gospel which has come to you as also in all the world and is bearing fruit and increasing as, as it has been doing among you too from the day when you heard it and acknowledged the grace of God in truth as you have also learned from Epaphras our beloved fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ for your sakes who also told us of your love in spirit right and Paul goes on from there but that may immediately took me back to Ephesians chapter 1 Right? We talked about this when we talked about before the foundation of the world. We say, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, as Ephesians 1, to the saints who are in Ephesus. I think this is the New King James, actually. Grace to you and peace from God, God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. There it is again. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his, the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he has made abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, etc., etc. Now, the thing that jumped out at me is Paul is saying how absolutely, absolutely wonderful and how much he loves these Christians in Ephesus and in uh, Colossae, how much he loves them. And they're absolutely wonderful people. They are full of love. Uh, they are kind. They are giving, right? But we looked at this in Ephesians 1, where Paul says, in verse 15, Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age which is to come, right? What we're saying here is Paul says, you're great, you're wonderful, I love you, you're my brothers and sisters in Christ, absolutely, you, you are full of love, you are full of the Spirit of God, but, 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 apparently they did not have the full spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God. They did not have their eyes of understanding enlightened yet, right? Because they did not understand the hope of his calling. We've talked about the calling here, and Ephesians talks about walking according to the calling to which you have been called, the hope to which you have been hoped. And that is a heavenly hope. It's not an earthly one. It's not an earthly, it's not the meek shall inherit the earth, right? It is not the new Jerusalem which comes down to earth. This is a glorious inheritance in the heavenly places, in the far above the heavens, far above principality and power. Right? This has nothing to do with the earth. This is what Paul is praying to understand. He's not being, we're not, you know, those of us who, who have this understanding, we don't separate from other Christians in general. Obviously, our Bible studies, they're not interested in them. They're welcome to them, but they're not going to be really interested in them. Like this one, if you're not interested, uh, hopefully you are, right? But we don't say that they're any less Christian than we are. We're not putting ourselves above them. We're not in a nomination or anything like that. We just do it as Paul did. We pray that they would come to an understanding of the will of God, understanding the inheritance that is waiting for them if they step into these blessings, the unsearchable riches of Christ, right? So when people go through Ephesians, they sort of ignore this idea that Paul is praying that they would be enlightened. Enlightened unto what? They already believe the gospel. They're wonderful saints. They love the saints. They're wonderful. They're wonderful Christians. Wonderful people. But Paul is praying that they have enlightenment on top of that, unto the revelation of God of the calling, right? The calling of this age in the far above the heavens. Get your mind off the things of the earth, right? That's what we're going to find out in Colossians 2. Get your mind off the things of the earth. What you're going to eat, what you're not going to eat, what you're going to touch, what you're not going to touch, keeping Sabbaths, keeping feast days, all those things are in there, right? As warnings to get, those are earthly things. They have their place. They're not wrong. I mean, they're not evil on their own because they have their place. 
Just like building an ark. It wasn't wrong for Noah to build an ark because of where he lived in the situation he was in, in the times in which he faced, and the commandment of God. But it'd be stupid for me to build an ark because there's no flood coming. It doesn't make sense to the age in which I live. Right? And mankind hasn't been completely corrupted. So again, and there's no flood coming. <laughs> Biggest point of all. God's promised no more floods. So that's what that's dispensationalism right there. It's just understanding the age in which you live, the promises that are before you, the hope that you have, and not getting them all confused and muddling them up with other people's hopes. All right? So when you get into Colossians, Paul is saying the same thing. You're absolutely wonderful people, right? And you got, I mean, I'm not going to read all of it. You can go read Colossians 1 on your own, right? All things are held together by him. This is the preeminence of Christ over all things. And, and Paul talks here about the fullness. We should do a whole message on the fullness, right? The fullness of the word of God, which Paul finished. Paul filled up what was left behind of Christ. He filled up the word of God by, by finishing the canon in 2 Timothy, right? The, the final revelation, not that, not that all prophecy has been filled. It hasn't. Book of Revelation is still to come. Isaiah, Zechariah, Ezekiel, all those things. The second, second covenant, the new covenant is yet to come. Those are still all unfulfilled. But as far as the revelation of God to mankind, it ended with Paul at 2 Timothy. Right? And Paul, I rejoice in sufferings for your sakes, right? The body, which is the church, which he became a minister according to the dispensation of God, which was given to Paul, given to me for you to fill the word of God. The mystery which was hidden away from ages and from generations, but has now been made manifest to the saints. We talked about that in Ephesians, right? This is the thing that was hidden from before the foundation of the world. We did a whole message on before the foundation of the world, right? And the difference is, these are things that before the law, before the fall, before paradise, right? Before Egypt, before Mount Sinai, before the Ten Commandments, before the promise of the kingdom, before Israel, all right, these are blessings from before, not since or from the foundation of the world. And we talked about Paul in the book of Acts. We went through that and we said, Paul only witnessed in the book of Acts those things that were, re that were revealed by Moses and the prophets. Only revealed by Moses and the prophets. Right? That's not this. That's what we talked about in Ephesians. It was hidden from the prophets, not revealed to man. The hope that we're looking at far above the heavens at the, the right hand of Christ, the right hand of God, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of the Father. These are blessings far above the heavens, something to do with the earth. And this is the differences we have to compare. So the book of Acts, Paul's in, he said, I'm bound for the hope of Israel. And it says very late in the book of Acts, Paul testifies that our 12 tribes still wait for that restoration. And the whole book is about the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. We're not 12 tribes. This is after the cross, after the resurrection. The 12 tribes of Israel were still waiting for that restoration, and they will get it. This is post-Acts where Paul is witnessing to a new hope, right? A new hope. Right, hidden before the foundation of the ages, right? To whom God wished to make known what the riches is of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, who we proclaim admonishing every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, in order that we may present every man perfect, that's complete, mature, finishing the race in Christ Jesus, for which I also labor, striving according to the invigoration, which invigorates me with power, right? This is Paul. Again, it's all through this second half. Paul is again pleading with them, right? Paul is again pleading with these wonderful Christians in, in Colossae, like he was in Ephesians, that they would have this understanding. He, it, this is his labor. He's laboring among Christians. He's not laboring among the lost. He's laboring among Christians, right? This is the calling that Paul has. This calling that says it's to him alone. He was the apostle to the, to the uncircumcision, to Gentiles in the book of Acts, to preach to them faith of Abraham, to which they could be then grafted in to the blessings of Israel, the fatness of Israel, 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 Israel. But now it's something different. Now he's talking about blessings in the far above the heavens. Blessings that are the riches of Christ, the unsearchable riches of Christ, right? And we've talked about that before. What are the unsearchable riches of Christ? I don't know, they're unsearchable. We're not going to go through it here, but the Abraham was shown the length and breadth of the land, two dimensions, right? And when we talk about the New Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven to the earth, we talk about the length and breadth and height of the New Jerusalem. But when we get to Ephesians, we talk about the length, the breadth, the height, the depth. There's four dimensions, right, in Ephesians. And we can't comprehend that. So we have the land, we have the New Jerusalem, which is a better resurrection, it says in Hebrews 11, for those uh, of Israel, that strive for it, they can, they can achieve the city whose builder's maker is God, which comes down to earth from heavens, the heavens. But then there's the far above the heavens. It's a different hope, right? We're all saved by grace through faith. 
We're all, everything is dependent upon the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything gives glory to him. But there's blessings from since the foundation of the world and those before the foundation of the world. And that's the setting for Colossians 2. It's in Ephesians, it's in Colossians. We talked about Philippians before. We talked about Philippians and the enemies of the cross of Christ. And Philippians is going on to maturity. Going on to maturity, right? I've written about this on the blog too. Stepping on to maturity instead of going back to perdition and loss. That's You can do that in your life. Right? The Christian life isn't just you get saved, you go to heaven, you have water fights the river life of Jesus. Right? That's not it. It's a walk. Right? And we'll be judged by our service and our walk. Right? And, and I can't judge you. That's between you and the Lord. Right? But there's going to be those that suffer loss. And there's going to be those that get rewards. And there's so those who have other hopes who are going to achieve the new, the blessings in the far above heavens. And then we see in, when the Lord's speaking, he's saying there's going to become Gentiles who are going to come. They're going to sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? And there's guests at the wedding. There's wedding. There's guests at the wedding. There's a wedding feast. It's all to do with the earth, Israel, the New Jerusalem. That's got nothing to do with us. Our blessings in the far above the heavens, right? But all of these things, all of these blessings, ruling and reigning with him is what the Lord talks about with us. If we suffer with him, we will reign with him. It all has to do with understanding and walking to the calling to which you were called. Now, if I go to Jerusalem, build a temple, start doing sacrifices, it's all biblical. It's all, but am I going to be blessed by it? Even if I put my heart, soul, and sweat into it? No, I'm not going to be blessed because God isn't asking me to do that. Right? So people who are going about saying Yeshua and keeping Jewish feasts and keeping the Sabbath, God's not asking them to do any of that. Right? They're not walking according to the calling to which they have been called. And that's what Paul's pleading with here in Colossians 1 and Ephesians 1. He's pleading with these people saying, you're such wonderful, lovely Christians. I just pray that you would be enlightened unto this mystery, enlightened unto this dispensation in which you live, this stewardship which you've been given. Right? So that's what it's all about. That's the setting for Colossians 2. And I'm so anxious to get to it, but I really want to break it down a little bit more. You know, the, the podcast, I might, do, I might do one on it, I might do two, depending on how we go. I, I try, I'm not going to try to get too deep into it. I want to kind of get through it, but I want to give you something you can sink your teeth into. But you have to understand this setting of it, which is Ephesians 1, Colossians 1, praying for your enlightenment. So we're going to stop there. We're going to move on. We're going to keep this thing around 25-ish minutes if we can do that. It's going to be a cool thing and everything like this, like that. And let's pray that all of us will be enlightened because all of us have failing minds. All of us have decaying minds. All of us are limited and we need one another. That's the whole point of a body. So take care.